This is Peter Vickersland, and this course is Fundamentals of Public Health Engineering. And in this brief uh, video, I want to explain exactly what public health engineering is all about. And to do so, I've got three images on this slide. I've got a dripping water spot, I have a toilet, and I have a bar of soap. And the point here is effectively to illustrate that with clean water and with sanitation, you can effectively control a lot of uh, public health issues. So what exactly is public health engineering? Essentially, you could think of it as the application of engineering principles for the protection of human and ecologic health. And with this particular set of videos, our goal is for every single one of you to obtain the knowledge. I apologize for the large writing. The skills. And the methodology. to minimize and prevent the spread of communicable diseases, and to ultimately limit the threats of anthropogenic and natural hazards. So we're going to do this by examining disease transmission characteristics, natural and anthropogenic hazards, and learning entropic control strategies. And in particular, we're going to look at historical trends to try and understand how and why things occur. So why is a disease appearing now when it hasn't appeared in the past? And then we're going to think about how that relates to current events and then extrapolate ultimately to the future. Now a point that I want to make is that public health engineering is not anything that's new. People have been doing public health engineering ever since the essentially the dawn of time and the beginning of recorded history. To provide an example, here we've got a cartoon illustrating an ancient Minoan sewer system where effectively you have a toilet seat, and then you have water that is used for flushing uh, waste materials into a drain, and then there's a picture on the right hand side effectively looking at these drains in modern times. So clearly people, even back then, were concerned about trying to separate feces and other waste materials away from water supplies and away from their daily lives. Another example of thinking about uh, water and sanitation from olden times are the Roman aqueducts, where essentially we had water transport that allowed the growth of large cities like Rome, where water was transported from springs or lakes or other rivers well away from um, where it needed to be used, and essentially they had these beautiful structures that were built to, to move water um, long distances, where the term aqueduct essentially comes from the Latin, where aqua is water, and ductus is an enclosed passage. Now, aqueducts, there's kind of the very visible parts of the aqueduct, but then there's also a lot of tunnels, hence the term uh, name aqueduct. So this is just a map illustrating the long distances that they actually moved water from the outskirts outside of Rome, ultimately, into the city. So some of these aqueducts, 56 miles for the aqua Anio Novus aqueduct. And then we have other ones that are much shorter. But effectively, it was through the growth and the spread of these aqueducts that Rome was ultimately able to become the city that it became. Now, this is just a map illustrating what Rome looked like in 250 BC, where essentially there are the beginnings of aqueducts that are coming into town. Um, and it's still a fairly small place. But 1 AD, effectively, you get to the point where you now have larger number of aqueducts, and you actually have the beginnings of a sewer system. And this is essentially uh, what is known as the cloaca maxima, which is a rudimentary sewer system, but essentially they had people that put toilets over the top of it and effectively were able to um, use it to separate waste material from um, the water and the people within the town of Rome. As you go forward in time, Rome continues to grow. And it's able to grow because they have more and more aqueducts that are bringing water from different parts of present-day Italy. So effectively, it was by the Roman engineering that allowed this to happen that the wealth and the power of Rome was able to develop. Now, so now the power and prestige of Rome wasn't just limited to Rome itself, but actually spread throughout Europe, spread throughout North Africa, spread throughout uh, western parts of Asia. So clearly they were able to do this, not only because they had built aqueducts to uh, feed Rome, they had built similar structures across the entire breadth of the Roman Empire. So the Pont de Garde in France, or the Cesara Martina in uh, Israel, and then the beautiful um, aqueduct that 
towers over present-day Segovia, Spain. So all of these things were possible, and the breadth of the Roman Empire was possible because they were able to be very good public health engineers and provide water for the people that needed it. Of course, the Romans were not the only public health engineers out there. Um, this is an example from uh, modern-day Peru. This is Tambo Meche, which is an Incan ruin. And effectively, this is a water structure where there were aqueducts were running through all of these terraced rocks, and essentially they were moving water to where they wanted to be able to use it. Another example uh, is the Hopi aqueducts, which are in is it the India. The Hopi was at one point the second largest city in the world, behind only Beijing. And effectively this structure, this beautiful structure, and you can see people walking around it, this was at one point underground. So it wasn't until it was excavated that people actually realized it was there. But the city had half a million people in it way back in 1500. And it was able to have half a million people in it because of structures like this. Moving from water supply to sanitation, this is an image from 19th century London, where essentially these gentlemen, so these people that are walking here, they are night sowmen. And essentially what they're doing is they're carrying feces from places where it's produced to outside of the city so that it's being separated from the denizens of London and protecting their public health. Now, if you look at this, clearly the people doing this did not have um, very good quality of life. And so one of the things in this particular image is that this talks about John Hunt, who's the successor to the late uh, Mr. Brook. So probably Mr. Brook died because of some of the different diseases that he was exposed to. Now, you might think that this type of sanitation isn't something that occurs to this day, but there's actually parts of the world where people still carry solid uh, waste um, instead of having flushable toilets. So since we're originating from Virginia Tech uh, here in Virginia, I just want to point out that we've had laws in this state ever since the 1600s effectively trying to protect public health. And in particular, these are laws that were laid down by Sir Thomas Dale, who was the deputy governor way back then, and in particular thinking about um, what went on in historic Jamestown. And the point in all of this is that they essentially laid down the law that you couldn't wash clothes within the walls of the Palisades, or the Palisades were the uh, wooden walls that surrounded Jamestown, and then more importantly, you could not attend to the necessities of nature within those same walls unless there was a specifically set aside place. So clearly they were already beginning to think about how we need to separate feces, urine, and other wastes from people. So these are just images of more modern facilities. So what we think about as modern, we've got a wastewater treatment plant, we have images of reverse osmosis units um, from the desalination plant in Tampa. Florida, and then if you fly over lots of parts of the world, you see things like this. So we have irrigation. So all of these things are modern techniques that have allowed us to move to parts of the world where we wouldn't have been able to otherwise, to grow food in parts of the world where we wouldn't have been able to otherwise, and so on. So a lot of these things we have come to rely upon every day in our lives. But there's lots of things aren't as good. So you see pictures like these where you have two women that are walking onto a well where they're going to collect the water that they need for maybe the morning, maybe for the entire day. And you see pictures like this, or pictures like this. And the general thing that you'll see is that they generally have women in them. They generally have children in them. So women and children are the ones that predominantly across the world spend time collecting water and then bringing it, uh, ultimately allowing its use. So this is a big issue because if you think about the amount of time that is spent collecting water, the amount of time that is uh, spent in the lines, and so on, it takes up a lot of people's uh, potential livelihood and makes it so that they can't go to school and lots of issues from that nature. This is being recognized at the global level in terms of what are known as the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, these have replaced the Millennium Development Goals, many Millennium Development Goals, that expire just in 2015. And essentially the Sustainable Development Goal, uh, 17 of them, and they range from thinking about things like poverty, hunger, health, uh, education, but most importantly to a lot of what we think about is clean water and sanitation. And we want to be 
going forward trying to understand exactly how these sustainable development goals are going to dictate a lot of what we do um, as a collective society. Before I leave this slide, one of the things I want to point out is that while clean water and sanitation are called out specifically in the goal number six, a number of the other goals also have water and sanitation and public health um, built into them as well. So things like three, good health, clearly you need to be thinking about waterborne disease, impacts of pollution. If we think about sustainable cities and communities, we want to make sure that we're considering health impacts of city development. And if we go to 12, responsible consumption, we want to be thinking about minimizing contamination associated with the production and the use of different types of materials. And then if we go to 14 and 15, life below water, life on land, we need to be thinking about what happens to organisms that live on land, organisms that live in the water, and what are the impacts. So what are the health impacts? What are the ecosystem impacts? And this is just a listing for what is underlying goal six. So the sustainable development goal uh, six on clean water and sanitation. And you can see that we want to achieve universal and equitable access to safe and affordable drinking water for all. We want the same thing for sanitation and hygiene. We want to improve water quality by reducing pollution. We want to increase water use efficiency, one of the issues thinking about sustainability is that we want to make sure that there's enough water for everyone to go around. Um, water resource management, restore water-related ecosystems, and expand international cooperation and capacity building. So how do we do all of these things is a big question that everybody across the planet is trying to address.